Welcome to Fangoria's Colors of the Dark podcast. I am your co-host, Albert Kane, and joining me on this rainy, dark, Los Angeles, broody night, Dr. Rebecca McKendry. It's fucking pouring outside again. Like we had 24 hours of sunshine came out and my yard dried up, the lake in my yard dried up, and now it's raining again. Yeah, it's it's, wild. it's been pretty weird. And like living this far out, I've had a lot of people, I'll, you know, had plans with people and it, I just canceled all. I don't even want to get in a car at all. LA gets too crazy had, on freeways. Every meeting I had this week that was not over Zoom was canceled. Yeah. It was wild. Like nobody wants to drive in this in LA and that's totally fine. I will admit like the roads actually get a little slippery. I think it's because oh, really we don't slippery, have yeah. rain. Yeah, from like it's it all the oil, all the oil builds yeah. up, and it's it's so it's like you know some people will like will say oh but Seattle and Portland it's raining all the time but it's not the same because people are so hardened by it there it's this would it, be nothing and it doesn't rain here for literal months like it will stop raining in March and we will not see any more rain until maybe December January it'll rain again so there's like a, a good like ten months. Straight there where it's just bright and sunny and 70 every day um and then it goes up to 120 and then we all hate la on the flip um, side i yeah. love it and i love reading i get a little corner in the house and i just like to read a book in the rain like movies i like in the rain but not as much as reading in the rain is like the most relaxing thing on the planet oh the only thing i like to do in the rain is sleep mm. like i really like falling asleep yeah. listening to rain um but otherwise i hate it like you know the house feels musty i let the dogs out they come back in they're wet and smelly like it's just the kids come home from school wet and smelly like it's just everything's gross and moist and i like sleeping in it though Gross and moist. And that's our show. Gross and that's moist is going to be gross the topic moist. of the show. Uh, speaking of gross <laughs> and moist, we both saw a new film called The Seating. We did. I don't think anything about this movie was gross or moist. I think it there was a lot of gross dry. things. and There, there was some gross stuff. There, you're right. It was very dry. But, but very there dry. was some there was some moist. It gets a little moist in, in the middle a of the movie. Moist. You know? There's some moistness. You know? um, okay. So I usually, I'm a trailer junkie. So I always watch trailers. Like that's oh honestly. Oh my God, I didn't somebody... notice by you. We're the total opposites then. That's hilarious. I know. I know. It's true. No, I love watching trailers. I will just, you know, I have five idle minutes and I don't have time to jump into a big project. I'll just Google new movie trailers and I'll sit there and watch movie trailers. Or anytime a trailer gets posted on like Bangoria or Bloody Disgusting or any place like that i'm the first one to watch it because i like watching trailers it makes me even more excited about the movie and i'm already really excited about a horror movie so if i see the trailer it's like oh, now i can't wait and so i had not seen the trailer for this one which is an odd thing for me because usually i always watch the trailer first so i went into this knowing nothing which i never do um, and so I had no clue where it was going. And that said, I enjoyed the twists and turns. So it's a man who is hiking in this desert canyon. Um, it just feels like someplace around LA, like I would say, like Joshua Tree, maybe even down into like Arizona area. Um, I think I, I don't know if it's meant to be somewhere real, but I, I, I think it was all done in Utah. But I don't, Utah. but I, but I don't, okay. like you, I don't think it, it didn't get the vibe that it was meant to be Utah, if you know what I mean. It did feel yeah. like tw it's meant to be 29 Palms or something, but it's, yeah. I, and maybe it's just because it feels like we have areas like that around here. Like it literally felt like, oh, he drove two hours outside of LA and decided to go hiking. And while he is hiking, yeah. he ends up oh, he's getting taking trapped. photos too. Of yeah. He's snapping he's pictures yeah. and he sees these kids and these kids, they have no parents. At one point he's like, where's your mom and dad? Um, and they're kind of running around and they're almost like feral and wild and he ends up trapped down in a canyon like he climbs down and then can't get back out well i think um, i think he like gets he part gets, of it he, he gets trapped. trapped like well he gets lost because he finds lost. one of the kids and the kid disappears then he gets so lost that he's gonna be in its middle of the night in the, in the yeah. desert he sees that there's this giant crater and at the bottom of this ladder there's a house it's a house it's like a per and, and that's so, why he goes down otherwise you'd be crazy to <laughs> go down yeah so he drives drive, uh Climbs down into this giant crater canyon, like literally like 50 foot walls on either side, straight up and down, um, climbs down this massive ladder to try to get to this house. And then he goes inside. The woman's like, oh, it's late. Stay here. She's really weird and off putting. But he's like, OK, fine. I'll wait till morning because it is middle of the night. He gets up in the morning. Ladder's gone. 
And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, people steal it all the time. And he's like, you're the only person here. She is literally the only house in this massive crater. And then he realizes that he can't get out and that any attempt he makes to get out of this massive crater where he's now trapped with this weirdo woman in her house is completely thwarted by this gang of like feral kids who basically are fucking with him will like let him climb halfway up and then knock him back down and things like that um so he's stuck there and obviously they are unnecessary because i would climb down right now into a crater to live with caitlin shiel she she's actually just one of my favorite indie actresses and has been for like many years and i just and we i've I've, my friends delila and jay they're all close friends with her she was in uh you know she dies tomorrow and she's super weird in this. Like, you're right. She is, like, kind of off-putting and weird because you don't know if she's playing a role or if there's something off about her mentally. Like, you can't tell because why is she living here and not talking about the weirdness? And this guy's very frustrated. You definitely live, you, as a viewer, you watch his frustrations with not getting information, basically. And I found I found there's some frustrations with that, too, because unlike Woman on the Dunes or something like that, that's your comparables that you're talking it, It's yeah it's not existential it, it's it, those yeah. movies are, are like art house existential horror elements like without a walkabout but this is really much more like it's yes a folk horror essentially but that you never get all the pieces and that that's cool in some parts like you don't know exactly what all the folk horror is leading up to all the time but it's yeah like this this one it makes i i'm hesitant to call it cosmic horror but it's making a lot of inferences to cosmic horror where they keep talking about bigger ideas and bigger things and we do this for this like it feels like this folky cosmic horror where there is some greater thing at play but you never see it yeah and so it stays very much contained within this kind of canyon world that you are presented with even though they're always talking about kind of these bigger concepts being kind of the motivation behind a lot of it um so yeah this i deeply enjoyed while i was watching there are some really unpleasant parts of it um and it did remind me a lot of elric just mentioned it i think i texted him right afterwards and was like it's woman in the dunes in a desert um there's a japanese film from the 1960s that is far more existential about this kind of lost family man who falls into a sand dune um and can't climb back out and the the people of the town like keep him in kind of led him there because he's an insect <laughs> what's it called the study of you know the study of insects i've just totally forgotten entomologist. An entomologist. It, it's one it's in my top oh, 10 yeah. it's like one of those movies that and maybe that's one of the reasons i don't love the seating i really liked the setup like it, uh, probably 30 mm-hmm. minutes in i'm totally in i think everyone's good in it. it's very well made barnaby clay this is his first feature he's a very well-known british music video director like very yep. been around a long time uh and and I I actually dig the whole thing. Like I think the whole thing's really interesting. But once it starts making kind of big time leaps and kind of movie, there there's a part of me that just wants a little more of the what is this all leading to? That's not just like the mother kind of you know uh, yeah. horror. But but it is definitely worth watching. And we are you know one thing we talked about before recording this like a couple of days ago. There almost was no new films to even discuss. We've got a couple oh. coming out next week with Lisa Frankenstein and Lovely Dark and um, Amazing uh, Dreaming or whatever the title is. Uh, Lovely Dark and Dreaming. Yeah, yeah. So, we are really feeling the effects of the strike yeah, right now. In January, um, and February, yeah, February. And January and February are usually super light for horror, but like when we were looking through like what new is releasing Nothing that we really... needed to be cover really limiting right yeah. now so yeah we we usually have kind of a surplus where we're making decisions okay you cover this one i'll cover this one and it was yeah a little, little sparse this round but that's okay it's gonna pick back up oh yeah because we're everybody jump back in and is making shit again and so it means we can do some indie stuff and some weirder stuff yeah. up here. but the seating is definitely oh. worth watching um and again it's well made so it's not like a cheap really you know i think it's beautifully yeah. shot yeah it looks cool. um, and this one, this is from Magnet. It is out now. I think it's released last week. Yeah, January 26th. And um, so this one's out now. It's for rent everywhere. I think, um, yeah, I saw it on Amazon. It popped up a couple of yeah. days ago. Okay. So I'm going to take us to drastically different from our weird little arty, broody uh, film in the desert. We're going to go with sharks deep underwater in a plane. Yeah, that was a lot. Okay, so we're going to No Way Up. This is a new one coming out from RLJE. Um, So yeah, I literally like, I got the press release for this. And the next thing I did was like forward it to Mark Ward and be like, you made this movie for me. Um, Like it's, I will watch any shark film, but just the setup of this, I was just so in love with the concept of it. 
And it was, it was fun. I will say that if you are not into your shark movies, this may not quite be your jam, but if you are into animal attack films, kind of even I'll say like environmental tension films or shark movies, you will deeply enjoy this. Um, it feels very much like what you want in a shark movie. The setup is that um, there is this mixed group of people on a plane. And I will say that this is kind of my only uh, kind of big hiccup with the movie was the people on the plane. You know, you could tell that they tried to make them from all different walks of life. So it's like a whole different mix of society underneath. Every single person feels like a giant caricature. Yeah. You're going to be the sweet grandmother. You're the um, person who may have a criminal back ground you're the ex-cop now security guard with a history um and so every you're the the rich heiress who the security guard is following like every single person on this plane had this like massive personality um so that was kind of none of them in that capacity felt real but then again we're talking about sharks on a fucking plane so i'll shut up about my character spiel um anyway plane goes to take off it goes a little bit problem you know where this is going plane dives into the ocean the pacific ocean and uh they end up deeply underwater with uh inside the plane and they can't get out of said plane to swim up to the surface because there are sharks all around them wait quick the question plane, scientific yeah. question could yeah. they anyway can can you underwater even open the door with the decompression <laughs> be to Extreme. There's already holes in the plane. It's slowly filling up uh, with water. Okay. Yeah. So they are slowly. So that's part of it. So there's a lot of different factors here. It's not just sharks, which is why I said even kind of environmental terror things like it feels like it fits in that wheelhouse as well, because it's not just sharks. The first one is they land on a very sharp incline pitch about to go over a cliff that's going to like lead down into the dark abyss. And the plane Anytime they move around the plane too much, it starts pitching forward more. So they have to stay pretty still. They have to control their movements because this thing is like literally teetering on like going over a trench. And so that's the first thing. The second thing, the plane is slowly filling up with water. There's parts of the plane, the entire back part of the plane got ripped off. And they were able to kind of seal it up a little bit, but there are still, it's filling up with water slowly. And it's not filling up all the way because there's still oxygen in there. So right there, it's pressurized, but slowly there's more and more water coming in. Windows are getting busted out. Like it's slowly becoming depressurized. And then at the same time, there's sharks. So every single time one of them tries to go out, there's sharks. Additionally, once water starts coming into the plane, the sharks come with it. And so, yeah, this is, it was fun. Um, it wasn't as much sharks as I wanted. They gave just as much time to things like, you know, the lack of oxygen and, the, you know, who died in the plane crash and, you know, trying to make sure that we recover this object off my, you know, sweet departed that is left in the back and things like that. Um, and then the the plane lilting forward all the time. It's all really kind of evenly covered. So not as much sharks as I think I would have gone with, but there were still some really fucking fun shark kills. Um, this one, he dies rather quickly. Uh, actually, no, I'd say he lives to about the little into the second act, but um, Colin Meany was kind of the biggest name from this one. Oh, that the I Irish guy from the... Uh, I know him from Deep Space Nine, Star Trek yeah, Deep yeah, Space yeah. Nine, but he's also uh -huh. in like every single action film. So in this, he plays the security guard who has a very special set of skills, um, very much kind of like he's there to, you know, kind of diffuse the situation. Um, so yeah, this, it was fun. It was really fun. I enjoyed the setup and even the parts that didn't work. It's a shark movie. So I'm just going to go along with it. You you said fun so many times that now I'm terrified. I just can't imagine it could be I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anything that's that fun, there's probably a problem. Just, Does that mean the effects are terrible? No. I, well, I will say, don't go into this expecting... Sorry, my son's having a conniption in the hallway. Oh. Um, Don't go into this expecting the sharks to look like they do on, like, a massive Fox film. Like, this is not going to look like Megalodon, um, where the Megalodon looks, like, all shiny and sleek and still not perfect. But, you know, this is... You can tell that there are some budgetary restrictions on those sharks. But that said... I watched a lot of asylum films yeah. too with sharks. I just literally um, in the second half of the show, I'm going to recommend the film shark side of the moon. So I am willing, I watch a lot of Chinese shark films as well. I am willing to forgo the digital quality of the sharks and suspend belief 
that that is a real shark throughout the course of the movie. So that is why I predecess it with fun. Okay. This is not the, oh my God, the sharks look so real. I totally bought every kill. This is not that movie. This is not, I truly felt for her safety. Um, this is not quite that level of tension. This movie knew exactly what it was and it knew who its audience was and it executed that brilliantly, which is why I say it's for shark completionists. Okay, well, I'll recommend a Airport 77 because the plane <laughs> crashes into the water. I don't think there's really sharks played into that, but it is, no? it's got good actors. It's got Jack Lemmon flying a plane with a mustache, no less. I don't think I've ever yeah. seen him with a mustache. Uh, that's a good film. Um, all right, I'm going to go for saying that uncategorizable one of the craziest things you will see this year uh it was a screening link uh, to a movie about to come out from altered innocence uh if you thought that you needed a film that is peter greenaway meets crawl somebody made it and i can't quite believe this movie exists and it is called she is conan and it Wait, is what? Yes, it's a re she is conan. conan it's uh not a retelling of conan which is what i had first heard of this i was like oh are they just doing conan but as a woman, like, what's the point of that? Um, it, it, that's Red Sonia. Um, but no, this is not what this movie is. Uh, this is by director uh, Bertrand Mandico, who made a movie a couple years ago called After Blue, which I didn't get to see, but I remember hearing a lot about it. And this is wild. Uh, starring Alina Lowenstrom from Naja and uh, Hal Hartley's Amateur, and recently one of my favorites of a few years ago, Let the Corpses Tan. She in this film mm -hmm. is great. She, I she, love that movie. I love that film too. She has this uh, such a great presence in those movies. In this film, she has a dog face. The whole movie, you never see her face. She has the face of a dog and, and a leather jacket that has the word Reiner on the back in these studs, which has to be has to be a tribute to Fassbender because he's Reiner Fassbender and wore jackets like that. This movie's great. So imagine the crawl type Sumerian world. That's where it starts. And there's a timid girl whose mom is like involved in a battle. And this, this, you know, everyone in a, is a woman, basically. There, there are some background male characters, but there are no male leads in this movie. Uh, and this one barbarian says, I need for you to grow up, I'm gonna have to show you the reality of this world, and slices her mother in half, like literally disconnects the two parts it looks this movie looks like somewhere between aesthetically like sin city in terms of the black and white but also far more kind of magical shimmery yeah uh, you know guy mad in the cinematography um kills her and then teaches this young girl and says you know this is going to be what's going to help you grow up and become a warrior the dog-faced woman who's taking photos is telling her is is like a seer and has said you're going to grow up to be the the most intimidating and dominant of all barbarians you're going to be conan and with two ends that's uh, probably to get out of copyright i'm not sure uh and that that covered it well i guess crazy. lawyers back down they put two they ends, put two in ends. There. and she doesn't you wouldn't believe it in the first scene because you're in hell uh and i was like into it i was like okay this is interesting beautifully made and like clearly just fucking crazy like in terms of the handmade effects and background set design i mean you know pretty interesting i'm like I'm not sure how I'm going to survive a two hour movie all set in this kind of Sumerian world. Like just there's something about it might get a little old. And then as she's young, her, her first kind of trial comes and basically the next version of her. So think her in a few years comes and kills her and then takes over a more hardened version. So basically every time she dies, we go forward in time and sometimes forward in worlds and the person playing it becomes a totally different actor who takes over the role of Conan. Dog face person takes a photo and keeps this. So it's basically almost like a coming of age of who became the most vicious uh, killer of, of the world as, as this barbarian. And right as I was going, okay, I'm into this. I think this is interesting. Suddenly I'm in Brooklyn, New York, uh, like the Bronx rather, in a alternate like modernist art world type thing. And she's a stunt woman for one of these stories. And I was like, oh, wow, it's kind of a radical shift from these other worlds to this modern thing, all still in black and white with little splashes of color. And at that point, I, I really started to like dig this movie. This is a movie. <laughs> I mean it when I say this will be a, a lot of people's favorite thing. They'll see this here. This is one of those things that you will know in two minutes. You'll either be just completely out. Like, no, this is not for you at all, which I think will be a lot of people. And then a lot of other people have been waiting and looking for movies like this for a long time because they don't come around very often and very artistically made crazy beautiful the last sequence is based on my joke on uh on letterbox was i called it the conan the thief the wife and its lover because it's literally plays out a sequence uh like for 10 minutes that's very much that movie but in this context with conan and it's 
wild. It's definitely one of the crazier kind of last sections to a movie I've seen this year, but it doesn't fit into any category because you are still watching something that has barbarians and Conan like action. And then other parts that are like, you know, modernist New York. It's, it's something unique. And I was really glad I, wa- I wasn't, you know, and only watched it probably because we didn't have, there wasn't enough new films. So I, I kind of had gotten one of those screening links. So I was like, you know what? I will watch this one. Um, and I'm glad I did. It was a, it was a super interesting film and uh, French language. Um, but I think this is going to get noticed by pe- some people. I think it's, I think it's going to be, uh, especially at a festival, it would do very well because you'd be kind of in, in for it. So that's, she is Conan. You definitely piqued my interest with the time traveling it's, thing. Yeah. It's all time slip. Sounds... It just keeps doing it, but she loses more and more of her soul. She's becoming a worse person with each leap because she's becoming more brutal and, and a colder blooded killer from the young girl who had a big heart at the start. So it's very much about the loss of self as well so but the, all the different actresses m- multiple of them are people you'd recognize from recent movies uh french movies you, it'd just be like oh I, i've seen her in something and it, so it's now, very interesting that way did it need to be a conan movie no and, I, and I don't know question. i'm sure if we read about it it's not the, meant to be the same conan they're not like talking about those exact characters it is a bit throwing given that name like it could have been anything um yeah like because i i know and I think once you're in, you feel like it's yeah. different. But I know as soon as I would hear it, I would immediately be like, oh, God, this is going to be campy because yeah. immediately I'm like, you know, hear the lamentation of the women. And that's kind of the Conan that I will immediately go to every time. Maybe it's part of the point is they're just trying to like put up, you know, by flipping the, the gender of that mm-hmm. name. Maybe that's part of what this is. But I, I'm sure there's something I could look up and read about the why the Conan, because I do think that's an interesting question. But It's got cult film written all over it because it won't age much either because it's just the visual side i feel these movies that kind of do uh really great production design black and white will age quite well you know for the most part mm-hmm. interesting movie again it won't be for all our listeners but those who want this kind of thing you're gonna know from what i just said so <laughs> well before i jump into my next one i want to say holy shit have you been watching true detective yeah and i i, I find most interesting the venom being spat at the show <laughs> at the moment is the most brutal i think i've seen ever the first the fir- i will say what's interesting is the first two episodes were so um mystery heavy and then the next two were so character heavy and really put kind of the mystery on the back burner the shocking th- and i'm still totally in the thing that i'm shocked about though is it's six episodes yeah. i did not realize like, that till, i know thing up in two more no episodes? i need i need like eight oh. more and i was like i don't know but online man this i i i don't but what's wild it's getting is such good like traffic like yeah. every single episode i see a new article pop up about like you know oh it doubled its numbers again so even if people are sorry i'm coughing because it's fucking raining again mm-hmm. so this is not my weather i apologize for coughing on the show i usually try to catch that um and it's making my eyes water too but anyways um yeah like the stuff that i'm seeing online even if people are spewing vitriol at it for being supernatural which is the biggest thing that i've seen people complaining about is like i watch this for true crime and this one's completely leaning you know weird folk horror cosmic type stuff um you know it's doing great in the numbers and i am just so proud of isa for that so yeah it's I- just- i'm also and look for mystery i'm i'm a sucker for mystery and i'm into wanting to solve it as i watch i think jody foster's doing great work in it I- I- and it's a cool world I- i'm i am kind of bummed that it would be wrapped up in two because it means it's going to be fast you know with mm-hmm. only two left but yeah let's and maybe, i need to yeah. know I need to get in that ice cave and find out what's going on. Like there's, there's some crazy shit happening. So yeah. My gut tells me if it was just called night country, (laughs) it wouldn't have the same traffic, obviously that the true detective fan, but I don't think anyone would be spewing vitriol at it. I think they're only doing that because they're, they're used to some other form that they want, you know? I don't know. I'm fucking loving it. I have, I have not been hungry for new episodes since that first season where I'm like, Oh, it's Sunday. I get a new episode like that type of excitement it speaks a lot for a show when I can do that. Like, you know, so being able to see that I'm excited about. So yeah. Okay. But the one that I was about to talk about is here for blood. This is one that I had gotten a screening link for from um, our good friends over at Screenbox. This is a Canadian movie that is being released to Screenbox this Friday. So it'll be the day this airs, this hit Screenbox. And it is basically, this was such a fun film. I wasn't really expecting it to to enjoy it quite as much as I did. Um, WWE and Evil Dead, if they were combined together, this is kind of the weird 
very built love child between the two of them. Um, and that that said, as I just said that, I was like, of course I love this movie. Mm-hmm. It is about a guy. He is a pro wrestler. And I'll put that in quotes. He's not like doing like full like WWE, like live um, television shows or anything like that. But he's on the, the wrestling circuit where he's doing these kind of smaller shows. And um, his girlfriend, Phoebe, is a college student and she needs to study for a test. She also is a nanny for this little girl, this adorable little girl, like 10 years old. Um, And she really needs to study for one of her finals. So her pro wrestler boyfriend, she convinces him to go babysit the kid for an evening while she studies so she can finish up. And the parents are like, fine, fine. Yeah. Phoebe says you're lovely. She gets there. The kid very much like, I don't know what's like completely detached, just wants to play her video games, very standard 10 year old. And while they're there, basically it feels kind of strangers like where while he is downstairs, you know, just kind of hanging out and she's upstairs playing video games, all of a sudden these weird psychopath guys armed with like knives and machetes break in and try to kill them and being the pro wrestler he is he's able to kind of you know take down the situation it takes some time but it's a really kick-ass scene and then he realizes that something much bigger is happening that it, it gets very supernatural it's not just those few people that was a great kind of first act but it gets much bigger and much more fucked up and twisted crazy crazy effects in this like they were definitely doing a lot of like splat stick level comedy um practical effects in it this is a horror comedy straight up through and through it no point does it take itself that seriously um so it's it's more kind of um gory fun than i would say scares but that said this was it was a blast to watch uh well while we're on that topic of gory uh and screen box i saw something that was that I'd never heard of that was restored for Beyond Fest. And I was going to go to Beyond Fest this last year to see it, but I couldn't make it. It was late at night. And it has now been restored and gone directly to Screenbox. And it is somewhere between the kind of gory punching power of Story of Ricky and then the, and a Jim and the lo fi actor, director, like made for $2 of Jim Van Bever. Uh, it is a film called Adam Chaplin. Which doesn't. I want you to know, as soon as you started yeah. describing those two together, I don't know if you saw a pen was ready, yeah. my pen. It, I was ready. It's. I think you would. Find Adam. Chaplin? Adam Chaplin. So it's the least. It's probably one of the most. I think one of their tags was it was the bloodiest movie ever made. I don't. I can't say that's necessarily and true. And it's called Adam. Yeah, Chaplin. it's really weird. Here's the other thing. It's Italian. So, which is also rare for, you know, 2011. For me, that was the coolest thing because for years I've been bemoaning the fact that, you know, there really isn't Italian horror anymore. There's occasional movies, but really there's no scene like there once was. Um, And, you know, from what I understand, especially from that uh, new Argento documentary, it's really because of the advent of uh, how much went uh, television took over there and really just kind of killed their film industry, unfortunately. But um, this is crazy it's made for nothing it looks like very low budget that's probably why people like us maybe weren't aware of it back in 2011 uh it is about this guy it opens with this guy's wife being tortured by these thugs and all the bad guys in this world i think it's called heaven heaven's valley this world what the main bad guy looks like has a jason Voorhees type mask and this weird growth on the back of his head and a, a thing that pumps blood into directly into his neck so they're kind of like weird cenobite vibes uh they are they burn her to death in the opening scene and then we meet adam chaplin is this everyone is deformed in this movie except adam chaplin and adam chaplin looks like kind of your wwe wrestler model he's somewhere like very beautiful he's also one of the directors and he is but he doesn't have much character like he doesn't say much he's kind of this quiet avenger so he's trying to find out who in this mob have killed his wife and he's going back but to do it he sells his soul and this is where it gets crazy and he has a hen and lauder like demon on his back. Basically, you don't know it's there for the first like 30 minutes. And then suddenly you realize, oh, no, it's like conjoined to him now that he's basically given over his soul if he can get revenge on this thing. And this com- thing comes out and help- has funny little voices and fa- almost like a Gwilliam type thing. And um, super weird. And and ca- that's only kind of humor, humor and the over the top kills. But it's not funny. It's kind of a very it takes itself pretty serious and pretty disturbing. And some of the you know, some of the, some of the kills are talk about kill counts in a minute there are insane kills in this for an unknown film huge amounts of blood huge amounts of effects for a lo-fi you know shot on video vibe um from italy of all places again not a movie i was at all aware of uh and it's and it's a crazy revenger as it goes it's not you know like i think it 
it, it's I, I found it fascinating and there was moments where i was like holy shit that's pretty amazing on a filmmaking but in the same time it's not fun and that makes you feel good way it's actually a feel bad version of that because it's so aggressive and intense but i don't you know for the right viewers that's a good thing um really crazy crazy movie and again there's a sequel uh called adam chaplin 2 which i haven't seen from a few years later um i have not seen that one i don't know if that one's on screen box but i would definitely recommend people check this out also just for the, the the fact that you can get this much effects packed into a movie that was probably this low budget is kind of wild because it's really an assault uh on every character i mean he's just like an he's like the terminator basically once it gets going but with a hand and lauder creature on his back <laughs> wow you just completely sold me it, on it's this. pretty crazy I... stick with the first few minutes you might be like wait was this like a shot on video like it it trans starts to transcend that as the gore scenes and action begin um but again, I, ever, I, I yeah, I only knew about it because of Beyond Fest. So, did you ever watch Dick's the Musical? I had recommended mm. that one to you. A, I don't can't. Well, it hasn't been I three years though. It. Usually, it takes about <laughs> three years from. It's eight twenty four. I figured as soon as I said it's eight twenty four, you'd be like, "Well, okay." And I'm that a would snob. be it. It sounds like you're I am. I'm a snob, I but, am. Except this movie. But is I just watched Adam Chaplin. How can I be a snob? It's absurdist, highbrow, lowbrow musical if Hen and Lauder showed up midway through. Okay. And that's why you need to watch it. Wait, because 20, it does 24, have... 2026. Uh, mark the date, February February 6th, 2026. I have to I'm wait like, that eh. long. Or I'll watch it with you whenever. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll find a place. Um, okay, so I'm going to give a, um, a weird mention to i'm still not sure how i feel about this film this is not a glowing review this is a i'm still not sure um so yeah i haven't i haven't drawn full conclusions yet so screen shout factory um i started to say screen factory this is one of their parent company shout factory released jennifer eight and this is a thriller from 1992 that i vaguely remember hearing about I never saw, and I'm a sucker for any of those like lifetime serial killer movies. And this is like we talked about because um, we'd gone back and watched a couple of them for deep cuts, these kind of old school 90s thrillers, serial killer movies. There was just so many of them. Um, so Jennifer eight. This was directed um, by, oh gosh, I can't even remember, uh, Bruce Robinson, who did The Killing Field with Nail and I, Rum Diaries, In Dreams, like this guy has some hits. And then he did Jennifer eight. Um, you know, this, there were parts of this that I loved. And then other parts where I was like, I'm just kind of bored. Hmm. Um, but that said, there were good parts enough that I would recommend it. If you do dig these kind of 90 sleazy serial killer murder mysteries, because there was something really fascinating about a lot of what was going on. It was just intercut with these really weird love scenes that kind of really just pushed the movie to a halt every single time it happened. So the setup is there is this um, former LA homicide detective um, named John Berlin. And he is- Andy Garcia. (laughs) Yeah, he is hardened. We don't know exactly what happened in Los Angeles, but he's been through some shit. And so he is pulled into a case. He's no longer with the LAPD, but he is hired on as extra help for this murder case in Eureka, California, which is in Northern California. And so the movie opens with these uh, cops searching a trash dump and they find this girl's hand and they know that it's part of a murder victim and her body is all spread out over there, but they're looking at the hand and he's like, she's got these scars on her, like built up pads and her fingertips. And he realizes that it is from reading Braille. And so, oh, she's a blind girl. And then he connects somehow all of that to these other murders that have been happening in the area. And they realized that there was this seventh girl who died named Jennifer, which, so then they call them Jennifers. Like there's been seven prior Jennifers because they link them all. They're not all named Jennifer. Um, A lot of times they're prostitutes, they're people working kind of off the grid, and some of them are blind. And then um, they realize that there is an eighth victim that they have found and that it is Uma Thurman's roommate and Uma Thurman is also blind in this movie. And so the cop, she remembers him though. Uma Thurman is the only person to have encountered the serial killer and lived. 
So they're trying to get information out of her because she knows that her roommate kind of went out with him before she died. And so the cops are trying to get information out of her. What did he smell like? What did he sound like? Things like that. And you quickly realize that the serial killer is now hunting her. But at the same time, the detective has fallen in love with her. And that those are the scenes that just grind it to a halt where he's like battling his emotions of I shouldn't hook up with the witness those are just, they just grind the film to a halt. But it's got John Malkovich in it, Andy Garcia, Lance Henriksen. Like there is just a lot of star power behind this movie. And the actual setup of it, of, you know, hunting the serial killer and tracking what connected all of these different victims together. And, you know, that now we have this new one and the only person who was the witness didn't actually see him. That part was all well and good. It just had these moments of kind of emotional stuff that really pulled it down but that said completionist 90s thriller like your serial killer movies jennifer eight this is now available on blu-ray from shout factory yeah i liked this one a lot when i was young but it came out at a time where uh there was multiple uh blind thrillers but even blind so at the exact i think Mm -hmm. the same year or or so the movie Blink with Madeline Stowe playing a blind victim and Ed Harris, I think, being the detective. Yep. And that one was actually better. Like, they're both, I like them both, but I remember that being a really good little thriller. I, I've forgotten the plots of all of these, but I can- Julia's you know, Eyes was that, another- That was a little later, but yes, a that's later. a thriller. Yeah. A blind thriller. And then Mute Witness came out around the same time. So there, there's right, a the lot of time. things about your you senses know, and, you know- I was having a conversation with somebody last week about- the idea of ideas entering the zeitgeist, mm-hmm. kind of the larger societal or creative Hollywood zeitgeist. And then that's why we see like four asteroid films all come out in the same year, or this is the year of aquatic horror, that it's not always the idea that one giant film comes out and the rest are kind of following a mockbuster trend, that sometimes it is like a repo man, repo genetic opera, where it's just kind of something is in kind of the larger idea system. And then we see kind of two similar ideas emerge at the same time. Yes, it's either that um, or, or somebody to each other. somebody who pitched it at one studio gets told no, goes to the other, the other studio makes it. And now two things are happening, at you know. Now two things. But, but I yep, agree, that. there's something in the ether sometimes with trends that is pretty f- often fascinating. Um, yeah. But I, I like these old, th- and, and maybe we'll maybe we'll dedicate next month, we'll do a couple more of these kind of, uh, you know, sexual r- dark thrillers from, you know, the 90s. There's some good stuff in there. We could go psychosexual yeah. month. We could go serial killer killer month and play it a little different yeah as long as they're not the true story yeah. ones like the fictional yeah. ones not the true story ones i don't do the true story i mean I, I find them interesting yeah. but i'm over all those kind of uh, real life versions um okay so one because we didn't have as many new films i i did a quick and these will be real quick pitches a couple deep cuts i have been working diligently i think i've watched about 12 or so movies in the last couple weeks for an ozploitation screen draft episode which is this weekend uh and I am not using it the way most people do these drafts because I already know the seven films I would be putting on this or eight or 10. Uh, So what I am doing is I am just using as an excuse to fill in movies like more obscure ones that I just have never seen because it's a great excuse to force yourself to watch stuff. And then a couple rewatches if it's been too, too long, like Stunt Rock, Mm -hmm. I had to rewatch because it'd been a long time. But a lot of these are, are new to me. And so... There was two. You no, know I have a giant stump rock right, poster maybe. in my kitchen, right? I also own um, like a set of twelve of the original like lobby card oh, yeah. inserts. No, so, that, yeah. that that I'm... that movie, it's not much of a story. <laughs> it, no, as no, in, it as in, there's no story, but it has it's... explosions. It's metal. And a wizard. Yeah, okay. I just, you don't need story. You actually don't. Not with that stunt man and his kind of crazy. Anyway, that one's great. Um, but a couple of the ones that I had no well, the first one I had known about, I just had never watched. But these are actual horror films. Uh, I've got a couple that I'll be on our deep cuts, but this will give you a taste. And these are I'm putting them on this show actually because I think these two are two of the better ones, like actually really good horror films. Uh the first one is called The Survivor, not to, and I've mixed it up for years with Soul Survivor and all those kind of titles. But this is actually an adaptation of the James Herbert novel. And this is directed by the actor David Hemmings. He made a couple movies in Australia at that time, the actor from Blowout and Deep Red. This is from 1981. So he must have had a production dealer saying to go down to New Zealand, Australia and shoot a couple of these. But this one is a, about a plane. And I had always heard, seen the cover and I was just like, eh, David Hemmings as a director. I just wasn't interested when I was young. This is a very, very 
eerie picnic get hanging rock vibe oh. horror film it's very subtle compared to Ausploitation. that's why i'm i'm bringing these two up because they're not going to be part of my draft i'm not playing i highly doubt they would get drafted if we're in the doing sim film but uh this it opens with this um well it's got jenny agater uh from from walkabout and uh, american werewolf in Paris and uh, london who's one of my just favorite screen presences she's a british but she's in australia you don't know what her relationship there's some creepy kids and basically you're watching a plane take off and it gets just into air. You meet all the characters. As soon as it gets into the into the air, like, you know, not quite at altitude, but still below that, the top of the roof blows off. And this is big budget shit. This is not like a cheapie. The whole roof of it blows off and they have to make an emergency landing. It's really quite terrifying. You don't know what did it. That's part of the mystery of the movie. They He has to cra- do a crash landing in a residential area. So he has to find a way to land where, you know, the pilot... And it crashes. You watch it go along. You see kids on the ground. You see Jenny Agutter, all these people freaking out who are, you know, just witnessing it. And then it comes to a massive explosion and the entire thing blows up. Everyone dies, but one guy. So, so what, we met all these kids on the plane, all these people. Everyone's died in a fireball. And it looks huge, budget. it looks like a massive, like Die Hard 2 or something. And one guy being the pilot walks off and he has no idea what happened. And he kind of collapses. Then, basically, Jenny Agutter is probably a local psychic. It's all kind of mysterious what she is, but she is hearing from the voices of the dead trying to kind of get that they they want some sort of vengeance, and they're trying to speak to her to try to convince this uh, the one survivor that he's the only one can do it. He obviously feels like shit, thinking he's culpable, capable. The reason all these people died, and he has no clue what went wrong, and then you have people investigating it who are, you know, kind of suspect and trying to hide the truth. It has a really, it's a kind of a slow burn and not in the middle is maybe a little slow, but there's some creepy, eerie deaths that happen and little weird flashes of a weird kid things and burning dolls. And then in the last like 15 minutes has a really, to me, like a really cool kind of how it all comes together. It also has Joseph Cotton from the third man as an old priest. He's in two scenes. Like they wheeled him out just to be in an Australian movie. Um, and the lead actor who I was less familiar with Robert Powell, who's the, the survivor, but it's really, it's a really interesting little movie. And again, it does have a Blu-ray from um, the Australian company that's doing all the great work on these films. Uh, um umbrella so i'm sure there and maybe maybe shout factory as well in america mm-hmm. might have done a version of it but i really like this one and then total opposite tone and this is like i don't know if it's just me if this is going to be a guilty pleasure but this thing was wild it's a pitch black horror like it's horror but i think it's comedic but not for everyone in the way that killer joe's comedic to me like so dark that you're like oh you almost feel bad for finding it funny it's called lady mm-hmm. stay dead it's by a guy called terry that's a great title it's a really funny title and and so again i watch it going oh a woman's gonna die and keep coming back it was my thinking and it's not really what happened so uh it, terry bork had made a couple other horror films that i had seen from there but this one had a slightly bigger budget it opens on this famous actress's home on the beach in australia and she's you know pretty young and she's in a bunch of movies it just opens to, she's like nude and swimming in the opening scene so you're like okay and basically it cuts to her a gardener who's this guy at his house and he's got photos of her everywhere on his walls and pornography and he's like done weird cutouts and it's really gross and you're like oh dear and he's like a total modern you know the whatever it's called uh, uh what's what the people who are obsessed with uh online and stuff it's really kind of disturbing it's one of the like first portrayals i've seen that and then he, you don't realize he worked for her but he drives there's a film set at her house and he just drives by all the cops and everyone and then people say hi to him and you realize oh he's the weird plumber he's got big glasses a big beard talks to himself definitely like your idea of crazy guy and uh he starts working there and at the end of the night like he's meant to leave and everyone else goes and he kind of has kind of come to confess how he feels about her she just laughs in his face and then he fucking like a crazy murder scene he's literally drowning her holding her upside down face down in a fish tank to kill her and you're like holy shit and i'm only ruining that because then what the film becomes and it's in like the first 20 minutes uh the film becomes her sister was coming to stay with her and her sister shows up after this guy's killed this person. There's like a neighbor. And so basically this guy is now turning his attention to her and it's her trying to survive in this house while anyone who crosses this guy is getting absolutely destroyed because he's just lost it. He's gone over the edge. He's like this sexual obsessive. So it's kind of like the exploitation kind of dark comedy version of The Plumber, which is also a really good Australian uh, exp- exploitation by Peter Weir. But this one's way more intense, sexual, crazy, 
I would I just I really found this deeply entertaining um the cop who comes in towards the end is played by Roger Ward who everyone would recognize as the very tall big bold big mustache guy from both turkey shoot and mad max he's like the boss and man he's one of those uh, you guys you can't not recognize just because of a Aust- classic australian guy but um yeah fascinating movie that i had heard the title and seen this on slasher lists in the past but didn't know what it was and this is kind of a, a bit of a dark gem for the right person uh, listening to this who might have a lot of fun with this one so that's called lady stay dead and i'm sure it's you know out there i can't remember where i watched this one it might have been on a streamer but um but so those are just two I'll, I'll do a couple more on our on our deep cuts but they were the two i think i i personally dug the most uh and then tune in whenever that exploitation draft comes i'm excited to dig in that is awesome that is some good titles okay i am going to go through some graphic novels i think i've got four i know you have a book i have two so books I'll and two. i'll be brief on the book so I'll do two. Yeah. I'll let you do a book. Then I'll do two more and you can do your book mm-hmm. just to space it out a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to kick off with, um, you know, one of these is just a, actually two of these are just a real quick mention. Yeah. I was just going to start by saying, um, cause this was a shocking one for me. I had been in a conversation with somebody about when horror comic writers suddenly write superhero novels, um, superhero graphic novels. And I'd mention it because, um, I love animal man. He's one of my favorite characters in the dc universe. But when Jeff Lemire does Animal Man, holy shit, it's like the most amazing thing. And somebody was like, have you read Batman Court of Owls? And I admittedly am not the biggest Batman comic fan. Like he's just not exactly who, the, he's not the character that I will read every single iteration of them. But this one is by Scott Snyder, who is written a lot of horror stuff. Um, wrote the Swamp Thing ones that you love oh, for right. him. Um, he had been doing the Dark Knight comics with Batman. And then he when he stopped, um, I can't even remember. I think he was doing Swamp Thing next. And then he did The Wake, which is like this awesome aquatic horror one. And so uh, this was one of my students I was having this conversation with was like, holy shit, you got to read Batman Ford of Owls. This is some cult level stuff. Like this is weird 1% cult and Batman. Um, so I just had to give it a quick shout out because even if you're not into your superheroes quite as much, this was like so horror oriented. So, and I got the entire volume. There's apparently several, but this is the first one for the Court of Owls saga. Um, the other one that I will quickly mention before I dig into my other couple is I read note. I checked it out of the library. I got Blood of the Virgin. Finally, this was so cool. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. It never goes full horror no, it's more about I filmmaking think. industry really yeah it's very much about an editor for a corman-esque company having his like kind of midlife crisis and yeah. it gets kind of a racer head um, and there's and one story they... did you that one comic in the middle where it's just the western thing about the guy it is like a masterpiece like it's just one one so chapter good. about a guy who it's better than babylon the movie it's like it gets yeah. the whole arc of what you could do from stuntman, horse wrangler to head of a studio. It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. This was such a good read. And it does have like this very eraser head esque surreal quality. Um, they end up, he convinces the company that he works for to make a movie that he wrote called Blood of the Virgin. And then his experiences on set and kind of the the thrill of making something that's yours, but the dehumanizing nature yeah, of it pretty, at the same right. time. It's just for filmmakers, this is such a cool book yeah okay so digging into some of the other ones that i don't have visuals for because i returned them to the library i read night fever by ed brubaker this one just came out in 2023 this is like a little one-shot comic that i read in probably an hour and a half but i loved it because it did oh gosh what was the cronenberg movie about the the people at the resort this is going to kill me oh cronenberg's son you mean um son. The, yes yes from the last other, year cronenberg um, oh, stone skazgard being reborn i can ah, because okay, you didn't you. know it, it makes me forget <laughs> i know i know and i'll remember in like five minutes in the middle of what i'm saying so this it has elements of that not the replicating your body thing but the whole kind of um being on a trip and kind of finding this other version i'm gonna say a person's name and see if it rem- brings the title back james 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 infinity pool <laughs> 
Infinity Pool, fuck. Yeah, okay. yeah Goth St. James is in my brain forever. From okay. Um, so this about a businessman who lives this very kind of very boring life. He's not engaged in his work. He's middle aged. He is on a business trip in Europe and he's there as a book buyer. And you do get the idea that he doesn't even really kind of like like the books that he's selling or anything like that. He's working in the, the publishing industry. And he's in Europe on this business trip and he's really not into it. And the biggest thing he's having is insomnia. Like the first couple of nights, he's super jet lagged. He's having this awful insomnia. So he ends up going for a drink and meets this weird, mysterious character named Rainer who is there. And Rainer is this- Wait, that's our second wild... Rainer of the day because I just talked about it a movie is. with Rainer. It's a good name. Wow, it's a good there you name. Go. Um, it represents wild person. So Rainer is this- wealthy wild playboy partier who kind of just assumes that this businessman is there too to party and he's like come on we got places to go we're gonna go party we've got i know these people who will get us some really good drugs let's take my limo and he takes him out and he has this amazing night of women and partying and everything and then they he's like okay well i'm sleeping it off now he sleeps during the day he has these crazy dreams and then the next night he happens to run into Rainer again as soon as he leaves his hotel to like go to the the convention that he's actually there for. And Rainer's like, fuck your convention. Come on. We got some shit to do. And he stops doing the convention that he's actually there for. So his job starts calling him like, hey, are you coming? Are you doing any of this? But instead, all he's doing is hanging out with this Rainer person. And gradually over the couple of nights, things get violent and weird and it keeps getting weirder and the lines of kind of his old life and his job versus this thing that has happened just within a couple of days and his connection to this person start getting really weird and probably violent. Um, this is, it was a short read. But it was a really, really cool psychological study. Um, so yeah, with some strong elements, not of the, I can make a copy of myself, but kind of the falling in with these people who, you know, at first seem just like really pleasant people to go out and have a drink with. And then it gets weird um, side of Infinity Pool. So that was called Night Fever. That one just came out from Image last year. Um, I will quickly, I wasn't as impressed with this one, but I can see why some people are liking it. I saw some really positive reviews on it. This one is from um, Dark Horse. This is James Tinian, who we loved, who did, um, oh gosh, uh, perfect, oh crap, house the one the house my brain it's too late at i know exactly i've got it things. over there oh, really i'm gonna head. forget i love it. so james studio also does something is killing the children he's just like one of my rock star um writers right now and actually the last one i'm gonna cover is also by him but he did this series called blue book and they have years at the end blue book 1961 is the first one it's where i started he's also got a blue book 1947 that is coming out in i think march and he basically took true stories about people encountering aliens and made a graphic novel version of their supposed encounters with aliens. So this one is about a couple in 1961 who encounter an alien one night while driving home. And where it gets fascinating is that they're an interracial couple and seeing how people approached that and how much that kind of damaged their credibility immediately like from the word go it didn't even matter that they were talking about aliens just like that societal element just like completely changed the entire dynamic before they even encountered the aliens and so there's nothing outlandishly supernatural in this the aliens don't take over the town it just follows their true story account of what happened to them that night and it's got some good moments in it. So I'm going to read his next one, 1947, which is also about aliens. Hmm. So yeah, so that one was fun. And then my favorite one of the week that I read was World Tree. And this is also a James Tinian one. This guy is just like completely knocking it out of the park right now. This one is from Image. And this is about a group of hacker computer nerds from 1999 who discover this thing called the Undernet. And the internet is this evil thing that lives under the internet that is basically trying to get out. It's trying to possess humanity. And basically it feels like AI. It's like this intelligence that lives inside the computer that has gone sentient. And they create this chat room called World Tree where they're all talking about it. And then ultimately they realize how to bury it. So they work and they bury this undernet thing completely underground so that no one can ever see it again. 
Now fast forward to 2024, a couple of other hackers, they're all now in their 40s. They're working tech jobs. One of them basically kind of like owns Mac is the way that they portray it. Like he owns like, you know, like he owns Amazon or some massive tech company. He's this incredibly wealthy guy. Most of them still work in tech in some capacity. Some hackers have discovered their old WorldTree chat group that they were using to discuss the internet and has accessed the internet and it's starting to spread. And so this is like true blue tech horror, really cool stuff. How it's moving from computer to real life and back again mm -hmm. is really cool. So this one is World Tree. Um, I read the first volume. I know that there is another one coming. So yeah, this was by far my favorite thing that I've read over the last two weeks. Just really cool tech horror. Um, real quick, and I, I'll just be super quick with because they're books. Uh, I read two of my favorite Last, books. Oh, Nice House on the Lake. Nice House on nice the House Lake. Nice House on the Lake. Yes, you are right. All right, sorry, cool. sorry, sorry. It is on my shelf it. somewhere, but I couldn't see it until. I had to stop talking about it to remember it. Sorry, sorry. No worries. Didn't mean to uh, interrupt. Okay, two books, real quick. Uh, this one that I have in front of me is called Night in the Lonesome October by Richard Lehman. A friend of mine from New Zealand had said that I, he thought I would really like his writing style. And especially this one, because he says kind of got a little bit of blue velvet -y kind of vibe. It's um, real simple. It, it's a guy at college, 20 year old. He has just been broken up with when we meet him. So uh, like recently she's ended it. The person he absolutely was most in love with can't imagine life without her. And so he decides to go on a long seven mile night walk into the dark night with no plan, maybe to pick up donuts. And that's all he wants to do is be alone and be in despair. But what he realizes is that the night holds lots of other desperate and strange characters and weirdness. And it's really very sexual. And it was the very one of my favorite the plot. Like somebody would say, oh, it'd make a good movie. I'm not convinced it would. What it makes for is a great read internal, the internal workings of someone's mind, especially when they're 20 and the way they're viewing everything as a, as a what's oh this could be a possibility of a relationship or love or sex or it i found it really freeing and really exciting just love the voice of the writer and i have to read more layman now um but what happens is as it goes things get dark and darker he gets involved in one girl but then he sees this other girl out for a walk who's somebody who like breaks into houses and just lives in different houses and he becomes kind of obsessed with her while there's some maniac kind of stalking the streets and then there's these weird guys under a bridge who could be cannibalistic it's it's very realistically done but in a way portrays all the possible weirdos you might see on any night walk as maybe a little further um to the crazy spectrum uh than they might be in real life and it, it's it, i really dug it so that's a really fun one um night in the lonesome october and the other one was uh, a couple because i'm just but i like we've been talking about it, the goodreads having or having the app it's not really just having that but i'm just kind of holding myself like oh i won't always be reading again, has been really great because I think I've read now seven books in the first month of this year, which is not normal for me at all. I think last year I probably read seven books. So I also haven't been back at, fully back at work. So it's been helping. Um, the other one is somebody who apparently is really huge and I'd never heard of called Ronald Malfi. And I looked through, you know, reviews of all his recent books, recent, more of a recent horror novelist. And he had one that I borrowed from a friend of mine and now I've ordered two others. This one's called Come With Me. And it was freaking, the, this was my favorite page turner of the year for people like, you know, Joe Nesbo type thriller vibe. This thing just rips as once you start reading. So basically, I'll just do the setup. It's about a guy who wakes up one day. He's, he's a translator of fiction, uh, translates from Japanese to English. His wife is a journalist. His wife kisses him goodbye. She goes to the local market. Then he turns on the TV and he sees that a, a shooter has been shooting and his wife is one of the victims. Opening, opening pages she's dead. And you're like, oh, so you never get to know her. He goes to the scene, he finds this out and he's really heartbroken. He comes home and he doesn't, you know, he just doesn't know how to fill the void. And then he starts going through his stuff and he finds a locked box that has a padlock on it in her wardrobe. And he's like, that's not like her to have keep secrets. And why would you put a lock on it? And he opens it and there's a file and it's a file that's been kept over 13 years. And it's been tracking all these different blonde girls who have been murdered in different states. And at the very bottom of all the things is a gun. And he's like, wait, she's against guns. She's even said, oh, we couldn't have a gun in the house. And here's a gun and her thing. So it basically is about a person trying to fill the loss that he's just felt through his wife, but also realizing he did not know his wife all the way because she was harboring a massive secret that she couldn't tell him about as he then starts digging in and, and basically trying to solve the crimes that she never did. And it's so by by the time you get to the last, like once you figure out who is doing these things, it is complete rip 
ripping apart the pages. I did it in about, you know, 30 hours, a 400 page novel. Cause it was just so like, so well written. What um, is the name of that one again? That one's called come with me. And I just bought another one that got really good reviews called um, white something about a, it's set in the snow. So I'll let you know, but his voice as a writer is, is really terrific. And, and obviously I'm just behind on it because from what I can tell on Amazon, he's like, you know, modern day major author. I just hadn't heard of him. So um, real good page turner. So those are the two I just finished. Um, good stuff. I'm sure I will start oh. to really slow down now that school's going to be back. And but as long as I read one a month, I'll, I'll still be on track. So um, anyway, it's been fun. Good, good challenge. If anyone out there had the same good problem as stuff. me, I've just not that I can say I've cut back on movies because I probably saw more movies than I did last year. I'm not trying to, but. And thank you all for following me on Goodreads. I assume you got some follows as well. I haven't was... followed anyone back, so don't take offense. I just, I've, so far, the only two people I have on there is you and Dick, and I'm seeing a lot of requests. I will get there. I'm just right now, I'm building it up for myself just to get into it. Well, I just booked Paul Tremblay for a couple of months from well, now. We have to see his, his yeah, we got to see that book. I want to read that one. Got it. Wait, you got it already? I got a copy. Well, I... It's an arc, but yeah. Uh, what does so, that mean? Um, like, is it an actual it, book or is it on an iPad or something? It's an advanced reader uh, copy. So yeah, they, they'll me, pass them out. Get me an It's like email screener address. copies. They send them out a little bit ahead of time so you can read it by the release date. Well, so, I don't want to talk yeah. to them unless I've read it. I, I won't say I a will, word. I will put you in touch. I'm just going to stare at you, Paul. If you're, lo- lo- I'll be like just eyeballing you the whole interview because I whole haven't side. read the book. I also reached out to um, Nathan Ballingrude and oh, cool. he has a new one coming as yeah. well. So I'm super excited for that. So yay, book nerds. I'm excited we're covering books now as well. So we tackle all the media. We even okay. tackle YouTubers. YouTube, we're going YouTube now, really branching out into all areas of horror. So let's go ahead and bring on um, two of my friends, YouTube's Dead Meat. <laughs> We are so excited to finally be getting these two on the show. We've tried a couple times. There were some hiccups, but we finally made it work. I am so excited to bring on James A. Janice and Chelsea Rebecca, just a great last name, from Dead Meat. It is so good to finally have you two on. Yes. Thank you. We finally did it. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you recognized it's my last name. Some people get very confused. Yeah. It's okay. It's still a kick-ass name, and that's the important <laughs> Thank you. thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so I know we're going to be talking about found footage in a little bit, but you admittedly are our first YouTubers that we have had on the show. Wow. All um, right. Yeah. So this is kind of a big deal because we just went to YouTube and this is our YouTube feed. It is literally just a Zoom link. Um, and we just started doing this about eight months ago and this was like a whole new space for us. And so I have so many kind of questions about, um, okay, so I'm going to kick off. I'm rambling. When you all decided to first kind of start on YouTube, was it, did you intend to form like a tire channel and have 6 million followers or was it just, let's make a show and see, you know, what happens? Like, was it much more of a casual thing or was there like a business plan from the start? Definitely not. We are awful at business, unfortunately, but <laughs> Dead Meat wasn't our first channel. We had another channel that was sketch comedy and a series called Drunk Disney, where we got drunk watching Disney movies. And so we started that right after graduating film school at University of Michigan, which is where we met. I graduated mm-hmm. uh, 2011, Chelsea the year after me in 2012. But uh, even before you graduate, I think we were making sketch comedy. Yeah, we were always making stuff. Yeah, and it was just as a way to, you know, make our own thing, put it up there, try to get some. Uh, we're, we're both really into comedy. I wanted to do comedy for a while, still want to in some ways. Uh, you know, I do a lot of improv. And so sketch c- comedy was our jam. But I think we got into that a little bit late when it was already oversaturated on YouTube. Mm-hmm. But we did that channel for um, four years, five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just kind of plateaued at around 60,000 subscribers, which is fine, but not enough to, um, you know, be your job, especially when it was split between uh, four or five people doing it. And so at a certain point, I was like, well, I kind of, I, I like doing YouTube. We built up this audience, but I want to do something else that will maybe, you know, have less of uh, the red tape of the group that we were doing it with. Yeah. And so I uh, started Dead Meat since horror movies was always a thing. And um, then Chelsea made the podcast uh, as the like second like branch of it. And so we kind of have like a two prong thing with the the kill count series that I do and the podcast that she does. And then just all sorts of other things on the channel. And that was 
seven years ago now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you all have a staff now in a studio yes. and the mm-hmm. whole, so you're functioning like, like a studio. That's amazing. We are an S corp. Yes. Dead meat productions <laughs> is a, a actual legal business in the eyes of uncle Sam, which is uh, crazy to me that we are business owners, but that's, that's what we are technically. How mm-hmm. much did awesome. you pay attention to Like, cause if you don't watch a lot of YouTube, did you have to pay a lot of attention to the trends of how YouTube even worked or what kind of things were catching there? Or did you guys kind of come in blind? We came in blind as podcasters when we first, like 10 years ago, when we first started podcasting, yeah. but we've hung around so long and done so many iterations of the show you know, you developed that kind of We had following. to start. Yeah. Yeah, but there was definitely a moment because we were just a bunch of people sitting in a room talking, um, you know, not even really thinking about it. And then there was definitely this moment of, wait, holy shit, how many people are listening? And then it was like, wow, it became real all of a sudden. Yeah, I think for us, we've always just tried to do what we want to see, basically. Like the Kill Count is a series that I would want to watch. It's, uh, you know, informative, behind the scenes stuff. It's jokes. It's... It's like uh, fun videos on the movies we love. And the podcast is like podcasts we listen to, like We Hate Movies and and other movies or podcasts that discuss film. Yeah, like a combination kind of, you know, it's a film podcast in terms of like we'll review stuff. But we also get into like film history and theory and analysis and we even get into goofy stuff like we'll play games every once in a while and yeah so it's less about trying to chase trends because i don't think we're good at that we're not good social media people you know <laughs> like we we have the the instagram and the tiktok accounts but like when we're out and doing stuff i never i always feel self-conscious filming ourselves and like getting content to post. I just want to experience the thing we're doing. So we're, we're bad at that side of things. We're just like, we can make pretty good videos. That is the stuff we want to watch. And you know, seven years, a lot's changed during that time. And we've tried to slightly tailor what we do out of necessity. Sometimes it's very not fun things like how YouTube's gotten way more strict about gore and violence. And we have Oh, to... really? Oh, oh yeah. Good, yeah. Oh, man. When the Kill Count first started, there was so much shown. I just showed as much gore as I could. And the videos were still monetized. Nowadays, we have to censor. If there's a severed head, hmm. it's out of here, man. If there's, wow. if you even mention suicide, it'll get age restricted or demonetized. And you just have to like dance around all these content restrictions, which is so frustrating for us because we're like, we're, tr- we're trying to show people how yeah, movies are made. Yeah, we contextualize stuff. Yeah. And- yeah, that's, it's, that's a real shame. Yeah, because you want that stuff to exist with the context. And then Twitter has gone so far the other way where if we scroll Twitter now, it's just it's literally being hit with pornography or just crazy talk. And it's a shame because you want the stuff that matters, kind of like when documentaries would you had to pay for clips. And, and then there's times where if you're talking about the clip academically or putting it in context, you're allowed to use it. It's like we need more of that. We want the Internet not to be dumber. <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> yeah, that feels like it's getting dumber. <laughs> yeah. So taking back, you know, you said that you'd always loved horror. How, when did you all first get into horror? Was this like teen years or had you always been kind of gravitating towards spooky stuff and kind of yeah, we've got some different... of your early horror films that you loved? Because I grew, I, I can't remember not watching horror. Um, even though my parents weren't fans of it, they did like Night of the Living Dead and uh, like Serial Mom was uh, one that my oh. mom loved. So, <laughs> we'll see I, I remember watching, yeah. <laughs> so I'd watch those and Scream especially was a big impact on me. And then by the time I was like nine years old, I think I was able to rent the videos myself, have my friends over, watch them just unsupervised. And so th- I've been watching them since then. Yeah, uh, I was terrified of horror movies as a child. I didn't start watching them until I was a bit older. And then when I was in film school, I took a course at the University of Michigan that was like horror post psycho um taught by Mark Kligerman I always shout him out when I can yeah um but that course like changed the game I was like I I I had a totally new perspective on the genre and I still have all my books from (laughs) that class and reference them and like that that honestly I wouldn't have expected that to be one of the most important classes I took during college because it was like oh this sounds fun uh but yeah then I would that's kind of where the the passion that I have now for the genre started aside from like oh I'm gonna watch some horror movies at a sleepover you know yeah and we we met at college and we're just friends for a few years before we ever started dating but when we started dating 
the very first movie we watched as a couple was Hellraiser. <laughs> and that was before Beautiful. before we ever imagined it, horror would yeah, be like yeah. our career. It was just like something that we both were like, oh, you like horror movies? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. let's watch Hellraiser. And so that's a yeah. kinky first date movie. I like that. Yeah, I was right? gonna yeah. say, was this like a theatrical screening or like, hey, baby, you want to come over and watch Hellraiser? I or... remember we got White Castle. Was it White Castle? We got White Castle and watched Hellraiser. But I did, I think, because you were living in LA and I was still in Michigan. I think because you were visiting, I, I do think I put rose petals on the bed that day. For oh, you. We fancy. Watched Hellraiser. White Castle. It was, the yeah, the, the White Castle <laughs> wafting in the air as we watched. This is basically our Valentine's episode now, so that's good because it's hitting around, this just got around hot. the right time. You know, I like yeah. Uh, when when we met Clyde really... Barker briefly at oh, Texas cool. Frightmare in 2018, I think we told him, and and he yeah, loved it. Well, so. We were there too because I remember yeah, I got to shake his hand, and I remember being like, "Oh my god!" I just shook Clive Barker's hand, and it kind of blew me away. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah we bought one of his art books and had him sign it, yeah. and it's still on display. Oh in our yeah, we got room. that displayed yeah. for sure, but. Yeah, it's like I came into it so much later and I'm still, you know, even though it, watching horror movies is technically my job, I feel like there's so much I still haven't seen. I'm still <laughs> learning so much about the genre. That's why I will never call myself an expert on, like, that's, no, I'm I'm a very big enthusiast. I'm constantly absorbing, you know, new stuff, watching movies I haven't seen because there's so much horror. It's yeah. so big. So with that, how do you plan what to cover on each of the different shows? Like you're constantly posting videos. Like I'm so impressed by how often you guys are putting stuff up on the YouTube channel. How do you decide what to cover? Is it just kind of what's hitting your fancy that week? Or is there kind of oh, things that you target with specific audiences? Or is it a lot of, um, you know, publicists being like, hey, can you promote Lisa Frankenstein type stuff? Uh, we'll occasionally get contacted by studios to do things. Uh, most of the time, those are like unpaid press junkets, as I'm sure you're familiar with. Oh, yeah. And so like with Lisa Frankenstein, I got to, Chelsea missed it, unfortunately, but she did come up with a game that I played because she's really good at that. Uh, I got to play a fun game with Catherine Newton and Cole Sprouse. And so that that's its own thing. For the podcast, we kind of get to do whatever The podcast want. is cool because the audience is a bit different. It doesn't get the views that the Kill Counts do. The Kill Counts are the flagship show. But because the I, I think Kill Count audience maybe depends more on like what does everyone want? Like what kind of movie does everyone want to see? Mm -hmm. Podcast audience, even though it's smaller, it's more consistent. So we can kind mm -hmm. of get away with whatever we want to cover. Uh, yeah, the they're more dedicated audience, which is nice. The last two weeks have been prime examples of that. Yeah. We've covered some stupid shit that I- What have you covered oh, in the last two no, weeks? No, Becca, let me interject here. I was gonna, you, you announced them as our first YouTubers. I wanted to announce them as the first people to have ever been on any show who talked about fear.com in the history of podcasting. Uh, except for us. <laughs> I was going to say, I know we've mentioned it, Kate. <laughs> but, but we've never dedicated a whole episode to fear.com. We dedicated nope. 65 oh, minutes to fear.com. So, I was very impressed yeah. that you guys did that. When I looked it up, I was like, wow. Per okay. I just remember the guy going, perversion. That's all I remember. Perversion. <laughs> we quote that, but I don't think either of us. Okay, so having seen it with virgin eyes recently, because I literally don't think I watched it since it first came out. How was it? You can just oh, give us a little... Still no. snow, just it's to know. Incomprehensible. Granted, we watched it very late and we're very tired, it's but it's real bad. And then it's we normally, because what'll happen is sometimes I'll be like, look, I want to cover this shitty movie because it's shitty and I think it'll be fun. And we dump all over it. And inevitably, we get people being, you know, who are upset because it's like their favorite or it's one that they love. And they're like, you guys were so mean to this movie. I have not had a single person say you guys were unfair to fear.com. It is truly an anomaly. Well, we always say, you know, props to the people who made it because making a movie is hard. We've they never done movie. it. We didn't so it. yeah, they did more work than us, but you know, you gotta have fun sometimes. And uh, that's why we did fear.com and then followed it up with uh Hellraiser Hell World mm. because oh, the I internet one. Kind of an internet yeah. team like <laughs> And a lot of people were saying, you got to do that. And then James is like, no, we're, we're doing that right after fear.com. Yeah, that one. Um, it's, it's a later Hellraiser. You know, there's some of the ones during that time period that I actually enjoy. Um, like I, I've always thought about like, Hellraiser Debtor is pretty decent. I think I've heard like that from some six people. Six or seven. Oh, I've never Debtor. seen oh, it. I've only yeah. seen 
first four and then now raise her whole world. You, you know, in between what they were doing, the Scott Derrickson one. Um, yeah. oh gosh, Inferno. which one is? Yeah, Inferno. It's not bad. Like, there's parts of it that you're like, eh, that got a little. But weird, it wasn't but written to be a Hellraiser film. It was just none the, of the ones. Yeah, so. no. There's a stretch there of like four films where they were basically taking other really good horror films that they had, and then suddenly Pinhead appears and yes. is like, no, that's don't what, do that. Yes. That's what and then he goes, wait. Like, it's literally a totally unrelated story where they kind of just copy paste Hellraiser like theming and aesthetic onto it. And then every once in a while, literally Pinhead will show up and be like, don't forget, it's the Hellraiser movie. <laughs> and then he goes back to whatever he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. He goes back Waiting. to the internet. Yeah. He's like reading stuff yeah. over there. Yeah. yeah, I swear the one internet horror film, well, there's a couple, but the one, because I watched him back to back. I took a tech horror class during my oh, nice. master's degree. I, and, I thought um, before if I ever wrote like a book, about horror i think doing I'm, like I'm, tech horror i'm gonna be. try to write a fangoria tech article horror. about influencer horror specifically oh, okay yeah, influencer gonna... horror is a whole new thing it's that i love it's great yeah. there's yeah. some great influencer horror really movie. good stuff um but when i took the tech horror class i always they had us watch fear.com and then right afterwards it was literally like the next class we watched dario argento's the card player and dario argento by this point in his career was yeah, what year a was lot this? of flex oh like gosh this, i took the class okay so okay. yeah yeah, more recent. So this is like Dario Argento, not at peak Argento. Yeah, so I remember people being like, oh, it's not good. But let me just say that movie, it, there are some moments of it that I was like, this is so much better than fear.com. Oh, like yeah. it just sure it watching is. the two back to back, the card player was like Citizen Kane. So I need to rewatch <laughs> it to see if it's as good as I remember or I'm, was it I'm, just after that? I really want to check that out. Have you uh, seen Cry Wolf? Oh, that's oh, another yes. I yeah. mean, I love Cry Wolf. We that was, that the yeah, Becca talks about it a bit, actually. I had talked about that recently. It's a famous director. It was like their first film. Oh, gosh. It was, it's um, uh, the guy it, who's doing Imaginary, isn't it? Why? Or no. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, it is. It's Jeff. Uh, Jeff. Wobble. Wobble. Webble? Oh gosh, I'm I'm just going to Google part this, of the y'all. Wadlow-verse? Yeah, I think yes, Jeff Wadlow. He also did. Yeah. That's it. Jeff Wobble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, I think that was his first feature. And again, there's parts of it that are a little, but there's some really interesting stuff in there at the same time. Yeah. We like, gotta get Bon Jovi back in horror <laughs> yeah. movies. I don't know what we have. <laughs> he to was in that. He gets shot in the yeah, heart. Yeah, he's the problematic. So he's the problematic hot teacher that's kind of having a fling with one of the students, but oh, also yeah. like it's Crazy. Bon Jovi. John <laughs> Professor <laughs> Jovi. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for the kill count, choosing movies is uh, much more of a process, unfortunately. unfortunately yeah, you don't get to just. I don't get the leeway because if board. it were up to me, dude, I would be covering Slugs yeah. and Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker and Humanoids from the Deep. And well, you just like, hit like my greatest hits right there. I covered what? Butcher Baker Light Nightmare Maker on our last Butcher show, Baker. literally. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's the the schlocky even, and that one's less it's schlocky and more like it's schlo It's it's very much like after school kind of feeling. Yeah, and yeah. it's the mom, the the aunt. As soon oh as she God. shows up, and she's like in a completely different movie than the yeah. rest of the cast. It's, it's, it's David like Lynch Lifetime, it, yeah. Yeah, she makes it a lifetime yeah, film. Yeah. yeah, just weird domestic drama, and it's also like it handles the subject matter more sensitively than you would think. Yeah, strangely enough. Yeah, That's what I said. I, I was like slasher. considering like that it's a video nasty sleazy slasher from the time period. How it is approaching gay communities in Yeah, like the towns. gay coach is the hero. It's yeah. great. It's like surprisingly good and yeah. i mean that's not perfect but it's good what year was that is that mid-80s like, yeah mid-80s yeah. 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 yeah like aids panic too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes yeah, that's, that's so interesting for to sure. me. yeah 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 so if it were up to me i'd be doing those fun movies <laughs> but you know as soon as there's a year in the title that is pre-2000 those views drop because right. it's kids on youtube so who don't want to watch old stuff i guess it's old now but so we i have to like really kind of balance it out because uh i'll do something e even when it's not old like i just did llamageddon a couple of months ago because i thought it was a funny wait, wait it, llamageddon how have llamageddon. i not seen this it, it was like okay very low you budget. know thanks killing with yeah. turkey oh, okay yeah. so llamageddon is on the same level mm -hmm. uh, as far as budget it's basically a, a student film essentially but i thought it was a fun thing to make jokes my, about can i say my favorite detail about llamageddon is the fact that in at least one scene, you can see the um, charging ports with the camera batteries. That's true. You see those batteries charging. Wow. Yeah. And I find 
watched it so charming. Yeah, that, that was that was a so throwback. Real. Did you guys cover Velocipaster? Because if no, you haven't, I would that's love a to. Gem. Yeah. And it's also, I think, like 70 minutes, which makes my That's job right. easier. Yeah. But... Shark Side of the Moon is another one I will throw at you. I've that not is... heard of that. That one's okay. on Tubi, surprisingly watchable. <laughs> but yeah, so right now we're trying to, because uh, last year, especially during the strikes, we had to cover like non struck work. Uh, so that led to a weird kind of era. So right now we're trying to just bring people back with the big hits, like Smile and, and just all the big movies from 2022 that we didn't cover uh, and just like, you know, the, the big mainstream things that people want, which are good, but I, I wish that they could also have their minds open to the more fun, silly stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, Llama getting, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, because that's the thing that like we love the most is when we'll meet people at conventions who are like, I found this movie through you. And that's also, I think part of the weirdness of of having started on YouTube is there's instantly a stigma. Like people assume you're a certain kind of channel or yeah. that you're, you don't offer anything of substance. And so when we're kind of forced <laughs> to obey the algorithm and do like the most obvious kind of cho choices, that sucks and yeah. I, and we hate it. And, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 a weird job just because like we're definitely it feels like we're always fighting for legitimacy, uh, which you know if people aren't familiar with our stuff or if people saw earlier stuff where I feel like my my narration was more like YouTubery, I was I watch old episodes and be like, oh, I can see why people like fucking can't stand me here or like in, <laughs> I was in In Search of Darkness and I I was just in YouTuber mode and then when those clips play against really casual filmmakers just speaking it, it, it like it, it just stands out like a sore thumb and so like i i get so embarrassed by that appearance and you know but like at the same time that was five years ago and mm -hmm. it's like we're you know we're in our mid-30s now we're full-ass adults i hope people would be able to g give us another chance but, <laughs> but it is thanks uh -huh. for having us respectable podcast interesting. oh my god you, you do well anytime you guys want to talk about slugs you can just come back here because that's like oh, in my look, top man. five movies it's yeah, so right. good yeah it's, i, I think right. i prefer Let's it to pieces huh? i definitely prefer it to pieces if you guys yeah. have not seen his what? other film the, the pieces Rift. is glorious come on people. oh pieces, pieces is fine okay. good but slugs is less mean oh yeah i see and pieces. slugs has the equal opportunity nudity i guess pieces does at the end but yeah. Slugs has just like man ass. Wait, how much? Man how ass much? Um, <laughs> how much kung fu does Slugs have? That's true. <laughs> I'm really pretty mean. sure none. <laughs> yeah, but it has slugs, okay. and there you go. Right. So I will recommend his um, one of his other films that doesn't get enough love is this film. Actually, Elric turned me onto this one called The Rift, and it's like yeah. an aquatic horror. It's another one from nineteen. 89 which was like this amazing year of aquatic car and the whole concept it's basically like a submarine goes down to rescue other people who are trapped down at the bottom of the ocean and they find this rift full of sea monsters and it's yeah. amazing oh, great. that sounds great. so great yeah, yeah. you guys Same you bring up Sin junkie pair simon it's one of him it's great i think you bring up something important that a lot of people don't understand same with our shows is, is we like to we have a patreon that's just called deep cuts and it's just us talking about very obscure stuff and because we love it and we'll never get sick of it but i think the the more success you have it becomes a job as you said and a job is always going to be a job even a cool job to somebody you're yeah. living a dream life but the reality is it's still work and it's and it's work that you're held to a certain standard and i think a lot of people don't really realize that about not so much influencer stuff but stuff that seems cool because it's about movies i think uh everything can become work in that sense. and i think that's definitely true for youtubers as well the few that i know when i talk to them about the channel it is it immediately becomes about monetization and you know impressions and things like that so yeah, I, yeah. I work seven days a week it's yeah there's like no off days. It's real rough and and it sucks when like with lisa frankenstein we got to i got to do that cool little press junket but then we were invited to the red carpet thing which oh, was yeah, just a few days ago go couldn't find the time to do it or oh. you know, we, we get invited to a lot of stuff yeah. that we have to turn down just because it's like it'd be a cool thing to do but i have to get these videos made man especially right now when we're trying to really hit one every single week this year that which is insane these are 25 minute to 30 minute things yeah and i'm sure you like identify with this too where like once movies become your job and at least for us it's like a specific genre which I'm kind of thankful for sure. mm -hmm. because when I'm watching horror movies now any horror movie my brain is so much less 
relaxed than I am watching any other kind of movie. It just, I, it feels like such, it feels so much more active and- it's Like you're analyzing it in yeah. case you gotta be able to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, later. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I will do this forever because I, it's the one thing I never get sick of. Like I will never get sick of watching horror films. I still get just as excited about watching them. But that said, I do pick films that I think will be most interesting to talk about on the shows at particular times, or, you know, I feel like this will be fascinating. So it definitely does kind of control my viewing habits but that said i will never get sick of horror it's the thing that, that will keep me here in death and it's more casual me, i'll still just like if i have a spare afternoon i'll still just watch a horror movie yes. but, but like you said oftentimes it's like oh i think in the future we might be covering this one so i guess yeah. i'll watch that instead of just watching which whatever. one you want yeah, yeah. So so i think the difference is out- the video you're making oh. videos uh, you know like mm-hmm. when you're podcasting there is a casual nature to it that i don't feel mm-hmm. sometimes there's stress or burnout because you can get burned out having to watch too much stuff but there's never it never becomes work you know having to watch something for the most part whereas when you have to build videos and the 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 kind of stress and the time that you have to put into that that's a very yeah. script writing takes yeah. up the most amount of time because ah. it's it's like these long scripts and then the amount of research we do is in immense we have a dedicated research assistant and uh two other writers besides me who are making these scripts because like i i take them seriously i want them to be mini documentaries where you watch a horror movie and then you can watch the kill count and you get jokes and context and see how it was made and who made it and we just always strive for accuracy and, and like interesting information there yeah but man it's, does it take a long time yeah well yeah i mean i guess to your point about like the the context and kind of accuracy and behind the scenes that's kind of a, a cool part of i think it may be one of the most rewarding things about what, what we do is a lot of our audience skews pretty young mm-hmm. um and often you know like horror historically it's always been the home for people who don't maybe fit in mm-hmm. or you know, who feel weird or out of place or maybe have like big emotions where you don't really know what to do with them. And it's so cool to be able to contextualize these movies that are often so intense and they're made by artists and often really sensitive people. Like you talk about, I always, the example I think of is like Wes Craven, by all accounts, was a very kind and sensitive man. He made Last House on the Left, which is a movie I've only seen once because it disturbed me so much. I yeah. never need to see it again. But it's, I don't know, the idea of like, I don't like a healthy outlet for the most kind of in, maybe invasive thoughts or um, yeah, and, and like the- morbid curiosities. And like, no, that, that's a normal thing to be fascinated by. And there's healthy ways to, uh, you know, express those things and i just love when we have like fans who will be like i started teaching myself how to do like gore makeup at home or like you know drawing monster art and i think that's so cool and that's what's so cool about after having done it for seven years we'll have people who are like i started watching you when i was 13 and now i'm at college studying to be a filmmaker because like i got into film because of your videos and it's like Great. That's so cool to see. Yeah. I always, you this, want. <laughs> I always joke that we're like some of the only people where we'll get fan art of like us being murdered. And we're like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, so how far in advance do you guys start planning your episodes? Like, do you know what you're doing in March? Or is this <laughs> well, like a, we should figure out next week? Podcast is podcast is whatever I feel like doing again because like the the audience is so different. It's a lot more flexible. It can truly be you know even if like last second someone's like, "Yo, this movie just just got put on Shutter yesterday and it's crazy," and I'm like, "Great, that's our episode." Yeah, I'm looking at the kill count schedule. It is plotted out until the end of September. Yeah, that's wow. Right now yeah. we are working on like right now. Uh, Lost Boys is our next episode to come out, but we've already. Work, we're working on the next five episodes at different stages in their production. See, but, Elric, we got to be that prepared. We fly by the seat of our no, pants. Like, we'd we're, be stressed we, out like them. I don't want to be stressed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want this. We, are, we have jobs. We have uh, we have teaching yeah. jobs. We have to teach film. We, gotta, we yeah. maybe book like two weeks in advance. We'll know who's coming on. Like, I think we have a plan for maybe. She, she knows I don't even want to do a month episode. in advance. She'll, she'll write me a month. He gets like, real no, angry. No, 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 no. 
I'll be like, let's let who should we think about for eight? Like, I'll tell him, like, this book's coming out. We should get this person in for April. He's like, I don't even want to think about that. I want to be in the and moment. That's, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I used to be able to, I, I, for years when I first started, I was uploading kill counts the night before they mm. came out and just like they'd be done. But because of oh, the way things have changed, that's more part of it too. Copyright claims have become insane and so we'll upload a video it'll get claimed we have to dispute it that can be a month-long yeah. process sometimes to get that wow. claim removed and then there's also all the content restrictions that youtube and we have to go back and forth with them and they'll be like this is too yeah, extreme you can blur this more yeah and so yeah. so like it used to be okay i'm done with the work upload good to go now it's i'm done with the work except for the next month of tinkering with the work to get it to meet these standards outside of our control hmm. wow you know i have always been so worried about my kids just idly playing on youtube when i'm not around because i'm always like well what if they click on like the car accident i don't want them to see or something questionable and now i'm like nope nope there's they're controlling some stuff over there which is shocking um so yeah that's surprisingly very comforting to hear <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah, so like with the copyright of, can you use like the stuff from trailers can you use the score or is we, that like we use all the film footage, uh, because our our stance and our lawyer's stance as well, not that we've ever had to have any actual legal things, but, you know, just in case, is that it's... it's just say, like, our lawyer. It, it is sometimes, like, well, we do have some lawyers. But, you know, uh, with the amount of contextualization we do, we consider it fair use. It's like an educational thing. Um, it's obviously you know, arbitrary and ambiguous and murky, and I don't love that, that how... Uh, you know, undefined it all is, but it's also, we like to think, and I'm, I am confident saying it's promotional for these movies. Like mm -hmm. people, so many people find out about these movies through our videos and we'll go check them out. Even though they've watched the video explaining it all, they'll still go check it out later. So, uh, I mean, we, we do have our, our most interesting data to back that up. Um, is that when I covered slumber party massacre, it, the the next day was the uh, uh, trending search on Pornhub. Oh, the wow. movie Lumber Party Massacre became a trending. Mm -hmm. And same thing when I covered Wrong Turn 6. Wrong Turn 6, Last Resort, was a trending search on Pornhub <laughs> because people saw. And I censor those scenes in the kill count, obviously. I'm, I'm not showing that stuff. So I guess some people, people find it. wanted to see it uncensored. <laughs> and enough people saw my video and searched it that they were trending searches on Pornhub. Oh, wow. So wait, is Wrong Turn 6 the one where he does backflips? I'm trying to remember my wrong turns. Have I, I don't think I've seen Wrong Turn 6. Wrong Turn 6 is the hotel resort. Oh, no. uh, okay. Yeah. The last like one I saw, hmm. the last one I saw, it was like the same inbred cannibal guy, but he hmm. was doing backflips and like running around like a jackrabbit and he could jump 20 feet. Like he almost went supernatural without... <laughs> <laughs> natural like i think that was probably four five yeah, was okay. it was it like a winter resort one no this was it was still in the woods and was, they it, did... was it uh convicts breaking out of prison yes that was three that was okay, did I okay. Watch three? no i think you watched one and two and i think done. i might have tapped out yeah yeah i mean it's like, still joe's. It's joe's yeah yeah oh two two rocks yeah. i mean one was Could cool oh, one, one, one definitely one. One's yeah. awesome. one hit one, at like yeah. a formative year for me and i really mm -hmm. liked that one but two i remember discovering it in college like later in my years when i was in film school and being like this is so fun and smart yeah and, yeah it was so wild covering that then and watching all the behind the scenes footage and seeing Joe. And in my video, I think I'm like, this guy loves making movies. He seems like such a fun guy. That guy's one of our best friends now. He's over here all the time. Love so, Joe. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's so great. Aw. Okay. So you, when we said kind of like, you know, what's a topic that you don't get to talk about much, y'all said found footage. So um, why found footage? Like, is this something that you all really dig? It might be my favorite subgenre. It's not really a subgenre because it's like saying animation is a subgenre, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's more of a type of medium or filmmaking technique rather than sure, I necessarily guess. That's an interesting argument but then but, the tropes do start to spring and then it becomes a genre in a way yeah. they do yeah for sure and and when you know i i do think there are some movies out there that over rely on the same ones uh but when it hits it hits yeah so when it's good it's some of the scariest uh movies for like for me there's something about it that when it's done well it scares me the most yeah i grew up with a camcorder making my own little videos i had a paper route when i was 
12 and that I would go do at two in the morning and I would take my video like camcorder and like film night vision, just stuff out there in the dark and seeing found footage just instantly puts me back in those shoes. And it just feels so real. I love it. Uh, I love how some of them literally work off of conditioning to scare you like Blair Witch and Paranormal Activity. Every time it goes to night or the shot in Paranormal Activity, you seize up and you tense up because you know that something scary going to happen. And I just love that they're still finding new ways to to surprise me. Mm-hmm. I, so every time I'm like, okay, I feel like I've seen all the found footage I can. There'll still be a new one out there. I'm like, yeah, okay, great. For me, watching so many horror movies, I it's I went from like being absolutely terrified of anything remotely scary as a kid to just so desensitized, right? Like nothing super scares me anymore. Mm-hmm. But then. I saw Lake Mungo for the first time. (laughs) Oh, that movie fucked me up. I still sometimes think about it and it, I have to be like, nope, no, 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 no. You're trying to, you're trying to go to sleep. You're not thinking (laughs) about Lake Mungo. Like, just don't think about it. I had saw that one. The it was um, recommended to me by BJ Colangelo or Colangelo. Oh, nice. I always oh, yeah, say, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry about that. I mispronounced her name. Um, but she had recommended it to me. Like, oh, gosh, it was probably 10, 15 years ago. And I remember watching it and going, "Huh." And then the next night, I was like, "I feel like I missed something." And I wanted to rewatch it. And I rewatched it. And suddenly, like all these little Easter eggs hidden inside the film are just revealed to me, and it completely blew my mind. It is <laughs> such a good one. Yeah, yeah, we it's, love Lake it's Mongo. so good. We, uh, I was talking about Lake Mungo with with Mike Flanagan. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, name drop. That's <laughs> but he's like he said that his style of filmmaking does not exist without that movie mm-hmm. specifically because of what you just said all of the, the building the stuff, stuff into the background yeah. yes just all of the weird little the things that are just slightly off if you look for them and that slow world building to just the like pure existential terror yeah yeah, yeah so and good. you know who else uh, specifically cited like Mungo as an influence? Uh, it was the Hell House guys. Oh yeah, I mean, Hell House, which is is one of those movies where that makes sense because it is like a fake. Uh, it's like mocking or not mocking your documentary. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I love it when it does that because especially with that one, that was like what 2015, the first Hell House. It was yeah. around then, and it was like a true crime documentary style that they were doing which existed back then but i feel like really blew up the past three or four years you know where netflix has a true crime documentary on everything even if it's not resolved and so i feel like it was really ahead of its time there and nails that style like let me just say those ones are so damn frustrating on netflix when i've sit through four episodes you better fucking tell me who the killer is or i just mm, those ones kill me but i would i've been at a convention um it was in phoenix because it was katie cage i remember who's a friend of mine from phoenix a horror fan who loves found footage came up after i had done a panel and was like you need to see hell house llc and at the time i had to hunt it like it wasn't widely known yet but then i came on the show the next week and was like holy shit y'all have to go see this like they're the the final 20 minutes are just terrifying it just works so well yeah i just i'm generally not scared of clowns i kind of like clowns i think clowns are fun <laughs> uh and horror movie clowns don't like scare me but that clown in LLC <laughs> actually like yeah. Something like primal in me. It, like, I hate looking at it. I hate when he shows up on screen. I'm so scared of it. Oh, yeah. Oh. Elric, Deep Cut, do you have any? I got a couple. I mean, I actually liked all the sequels. I, I like all the sequels to the Hell Houses, too. Like, mm-hmm. even when they're not great movies, they'll still be moments as scary as the first one. The first one, the whole movie is really interesting and good. Yeah. Uh, the most recent one was good. Yeah, we haven't yeah. seen yeah. two or three, but we did watch Carmichael Manor. Oh, yeah. And I really enjoyed that one. That was great. I think two, two or three. One of them had a lot of creepy moments. I thought were pretty good. I, I mean, I think I think there's so many different. Like what I like about uh, this kind of filmmaking is also like the restricted point of view. It's so mm-hmm. I, it's one of the few genres or subgenres, as we're saying, that can still scare me and make me jump because of the form itself. Because yeah. it is, you know, you you really are changing the way the frame works and the way storytelling is built. And um, a different version of it than found footage in a way is the kind of live streaming or yeah. or televised event and one that i would just you know recommend anyone would be the ghost watch which is a from 92 oh, but it feels yeah. earlier but it's like a bbc episode so you, yeah, yeah i've been 
needing to watch that. It's great. It's, it's got some yes. really tight it moments. Is, I can yeah. only imagine if I had seen it when it when it played because it has these uh, has one guy particularly that I remember growing up as a kid seeing like my grandparents watch on BBC. He was the main host, so it just felt you know BBC even more than CNN feels like it's real. It's BBC, yeah. and they played this on Halloween night, and they got they actually got in a lot of trouble. They actually got more complaints than they'd ever received at the BBC because it was being oh, passed so off. Funny. Like, we're going to spend the next hour looking at this documentary about an exorcism or, or, and poltergeists in a neighborhood, and then it kind of spirals out of control, and you start to believe in, in a War of the Worlds, Orson Welles kind of way. Yeah. And, and, it's, yeah. and I, I didn't see this one until only a few years ago. Uh, somebody that we knew recommended it, and it's, and it's terrific. But again, it's a different thing because it's not like the tapes have been found. It's not the classic, oh, Cannibal Holocaust, here's the film, let's go find yeah, out what yeah. happened. But it is really good. And obviously recently, um, what's what's the uh, Dead, Deadstream is obviously taking- Oh, oh Deadstream. I yeah. love He's Deadstream. great. I love Deadstream. It's so you good. Know, I just rewatched it last weekend because my daughter wanted a horror film to watch at a slumber party. And this is like a group a of like is a good one. four 11-year-old girls and they loved it. And it worked so well because one, it's YouTubers, which is the mm -hmm. world they live in. Um, and then it starts out funny. And then it has these genuinely like scary, scary moments in the third act. And then suddenly they're screaming and it worked so so well as like a slumber party movie. So hopefully I'm making a little horror fans there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just, it worked. And I'd never even thought about it that way until it was recommended to me by somebody else as a slumber party movie. It just worked. It's so good. Um, I love the tone of that one. Cause I feel like often found footage leans into being totally serious. Cause it's like, we've got to sell this as real, but that one it's so great. It is. It's like found footage Sam Raimi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's yeah. So silly. I, I just. I think about Beef Ham so much. Where he put <laughs> yeah. the the GoPro on the like, like beef, beef jerky. jerky. I think yeah. about it all the time. And yeah, like names the camera. He like takes the time to name it Beef Ham. <laughs> I just. It's so great. And so fun. <laughs> So I have to give a shout out to a really small one from 2018 um, that I discovered a couple of years ago and had talked about on the show called Blood Butterfly Kisses. And <gasps> I I was just, I haven't seen Butterfly Kisses, but I was just reading about that movie and I really want to watch it. That's why I, I it feels it's like such a, because um, I've only heard good things about it and the filmmaker passed away pretty recently. Oh, right? I didn't know that. I yeah. Did. And it's Christopher a, Myers. Yeah. And it just feels like such a, it's so tragic because it sounds like this film, kind of like a Lake Mungo. It was like, a, oh man, there's something like, this is a cool voice. It is. And it was just, genre. it's such like a homespun, like regional horror. You can tell it's real low budget, but they do, I mean, like maybe four locations, but they do such a good job at it. And it is um, a couple of filmmakers who'd find all these old videotapes documenting this urban legend about this supposed kind of ghost or curse called Peeping Tom, where if you stare down this this spooky train tunnel for like two hours or something at 3 a.m without try without closing your eyes you just stare that you will then be able to see this this urban legend curse called peeping tom and it's this figure that you'll start off seeing far away and oh, every oh, no. time you thinking. close your eyes it gets closer so like when you blink He's getting incrementally closer. But if you oh, like look great. away and talk to somebody, he'll jump a couple feet. If you look away, you know, and go to sleep, he'll suddenly be like 10 feet away from you the next morning. So you have to keep looking. Um, and it's such a cool concept. And yeah, it just did not get enough love when it came out. It is real small. You can see the shoestrings of the budget, but it is such a cool concept. I've only, that like, awesome. I've yeah, only heard good things about that. Movie. Yeah, it felt once I saw it, it felt like um, my son's really into SCP lore. And yep. yeah, and that's what it felt like was like, holy shit, like somebody so got a movie made about one. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. It reminds me, I'm in the middle of reading this um, series that was posted on the No Sleep subreddit like a few years ago that I think the, the rights were uh, acquired to by someone. Like it's going to be made into something called The Left Right Game. Have you heard of this? Uh-uh. Okay. What is the left right game? Okay, the left right game. It's um because the no sleep subreddit, the conceit is it's people posting, it's all like in character. There's like a, mm -hmm. a kayfabe mm -hmm. to the no sleep where everyone I is love like, it. We're all pretending it's real. We're pretending this person's posts on Reddit. It's like this is their true story. And all the comments, you have the rules are like you have to play along with it. 
And uh, so in this Reddit post, this person's friend goes missing and they're going through her computer and they find these files that are, uh, she's like a journalism student and she goes to document uh, this thing called, uh, this urban legend called the left right game where this guy in like Phoenix gets obsessed with it and him and his little group of kind of paranormal uh like you know hobbyists they all go and, and the left right game is um you drive as far as you can you take the first left immediately then you drive until there's a right turn you take that and you basically turn left and right and left and right until you get to some way like you'll know it when you get there is kind yeah. of the idea is like something will shift and then you're in this other place and it's really well done and creepy. And that peeping Tom concept, it's that very, I don't know, like there's something about that kind of internet style of storytelling where it's like, if you go and do this thing. Yeah, seeking out something, something will happen. Facing the concept. Yeah. That seems like a good conceit for a Hellraiser film, like, because you could pull back and you're in the maze and you're, and you're car, in the car, you know, that'd be cool. Act Actually, if you read, <clears throat> let me push my glasses yeah. up on my nose a bit. If you read the comics from the late 1990s, that was actually one of the issues where it was a building yeah. and the building nice. itself was a lament nice. configuration. So, yeah. But I like it coming uh, from yeah. a subreddit. <laughs> I, think that, I, I think that's it's a good It's much model. cooler. It just feels cooler. No, Better I felt an internet this... cafe like the hell world was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it feels more real and kind of unhinged when you're reading it on a subreddit than no, you no. know like a comic book so yeah mm -hmm. but very cool okay so you guys had also put down paranormal activity so yep. that one like a classic uh um, oh yeah the whole series we did on the podcast we did a whole summer where we reviewed every paranormal activity movie we called it paranormal pool party and we dressed up with like little floaties and sunscreen and we did uh yeah every every movie and I had so much fun. Yeah, because because you were talking about uh, the way that with paranormal activity or with found footage films, it restricts your viewpoint and you have to find ways to play with that. And I always think of the third paranormal activity when they put it on an oscillating fan. So cool. And then it's just that, <laughs> that back and forth slow pan and you just know that something terrifying is coming and yeah. it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you guys like the most recent one, Paranormal Oh gosh, I can't even Ghost remember. The, the one that's in the, Amish the snowy Amish. Oh, I actually yeah. really enjoyed that one and I didn't expect to. I, I forget. Like, I think we, we I think arrived we at like, it, it was okay. Yeah, it was fine. I think, um, because yeah, I remember that was like, it was a, a COVID movie because I remember mm -hmm. getting in the car and the, the cab driver being like, oh, I got COVID like three times. It's fine. My immunity's up there. But uh, I forget what it was how closely it had tied into the rest of the lore because we're all about that continuous I love story the, yeah. like the marked ones and stuff i love yeah. the marked ones marked ones is one of my favorites marked ones is, marked ones is so, so good yeah. and i i always recommend it to people it's such a hard sell i'm like listen i know that it's like the fifth or whatever yeah. and you have to know all the lore from these previous movies and some of them aren't the but it's so worth it yeah, yeah. so good it's so much fun yep. yeah because are there seven now with that that latest one? Because I think there's one so. four, and then Ghost World marked ones and Ghost Dimension. D D Dimension, Ghost yeah. 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 Ghost. Yeah. I want to see Ghost World as found footage. <laughs> I would love to see a paranormal activity Ghost, Ghost World. Just these cool hipster girls like being <laughs> sad. <laughs> Steve Buscemi rolls in and found footage. <laughs> I'm into it. No, I mean I think that last one probably just shouldn't have had the name Paranormal Activity, and it would have been a cool like movie in its it own functioned. cult weird yeah. world. But that's sometimes yeah. a problem at the end once we start getting too far off the thing that made it what it was don't they wind up in a barn and there's like yeah. a well that they're yeah. going yeah. under that part i yeah. remember being uh, that was cool oh, yeah it yeah. got culty yeah. it got real yeah. culty yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 they're like they find the barn and they're they're like you can't go it that's right yeah. that's that one that, that yeah. part was cool that stuff yes. with me enough to remember it right now yeah. however many years after watching it once yeah, yeah. That, no there was some cool stuff in that one i remember it was i remember watching it during the pandemic and being like there's surprisingly good stuff in here more so than ghost dimension or yeah. some of the other yeah, ones that, so, that was the rough one yeah. dimension's a rough time it yeah. takes a beating i shouldn't diss on it i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure there were problems but, but is yeah. ghost dimension the one that ends with like the time travel no that's no, the that's marked, marked ones. ones that's why it's okay. marked ones yeah they okay. jump it's awesome okay yeah that's a cool one 
Ghost you... Dimension ends with you see Toby's legs, though, right? There is a tie-in, I think. Oh, I forget. I don't even remember I that. See the demon's like legs or something. Did yeah. go to the press screening of that, Elric, and I seem to have blocked it out. Yeah, that one. I, that one is actually the most forget because all the others you can think of at least a one key moment, like or something okay. in it that I can't really think Third of that one, key 80. moment. Yeah. Fourth yeah. one, Catherine Newton. Yeah. 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 Video Xbox. games. Yeah. 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 Like oh, Xbox. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I do yeah. love the connect. the T set. Like, there's always something that I can be yeah. like. That's like my cue, and yeah, that one I don't have much. Second so. one is the like McMansion. Mm -hmm. I, I find that one quite creepy. I, I think the part where you're watching all the cameras and the dad is like yeah, watching yeah. all the footage, it's, <laughs> it's eerie because I think it was one of those movies that as I watched it, I wasn't scared at all. The second it ended, I was like alone in a house and I was kind of freaked out because yeah. it just, got yeah. Scare. yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, oh, yeah, the kitchen one works, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I know we're pressing time here, but let me just say it has been awesome to finally get you both on <laughs> we're gonna have to bring you back you know if you ever find something really weird something really unusual that you want to talk about hit us up we'll put you over on deep cuts with us it'll be awesome we can totally pledge go night. deep oh my gosh pledge, pledge night. night have you I, watched that i don't think i saw never pledge night. I, I, this but is let me this i just put llama getting on my cue so i will totally watch <laughs> oh, pledge i apologize night. for that oh, but yeah. pledge night pledge, i'll stand by pledge night, i i can't believe we found something that joe lynch, joe hasn't, lynch watched hasn't seen and that you guys that's haven't crazy watched. That's to nuts. me pledge nope. night is an uh. 80s horror movie about it like frat hazing and also there's the huh. i don't even want to give too much away about no. it yeah it's all very it's an extremely political movie yeah and it feels like it was made like post kavanaugh hearings and like yeah, in, wow. in response to that but it's from but the it's 80s from the, it's very cool yeah. and it's fucking on tubi so there we go <laughs> and now yeah. i'm gonna watch it We're both tonight gonna have to okay. watch that for our next one yeah that's great yeah, it gets okay. Weird. So it's from Wait, 1990. It's got Joey Belladonna in it. Is it the lead singer of Anthrax? It's, it's that's it's, right. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. It's yeah. So good. Okay. I was like, I swear, I because one of my very first industry jobs, I was D. Snyder's assistant at Fangoria for a number oh of years. No. Um, and so whenever D. was playing concerts, like anywhere in the New York, like tri-state area, he got me tickets, and so I got to see it. I got to meet Joey Belladonna. So I remembered that name. Yeah, he's oh in Pledge God. Night, y'all. Okay, now I'm totally in. You guys did it. You came on this podcast and stumped us. That you is... stumped us. That is brilliant. Oh, yeah. Well, I Still must. I had to you. <laughs> I I admittedly had not heard of Llama Getting yet, and there was something else. Uh, you guys had me add two things to my queue. What was the second one that I just added? There were oh, two things that you mentioned that I was like, okay, I'm in, what? and I don't even oh, know what this. Right second one was now what you'll have to go it? back and listen because if you wrong turn six. <laughs> oh, wrong oh, turn oh, six. God. oh no and it Who's specifies so r-rated edition so do i need to hit pornhub for this <laughs> yeah yeah you might need okay. to find the unrated version because the r-rated <laughs> okay. version is going to leave a lot on the floor and i remember like making fun of i think it was that movie's writer mm -hmm. who came up to us at a convention was like hi i'm the writer of wrong turn six and i was like oh my god dude i tore into your movie and he had a blast he was like That's i cool. loved it it was so yeah. fun he your was video so, so, he was nice. so nice and it's Aww. so cool when when filmmakers are able to be like that because like god if i made something and it got torn apart i would i hope i would be that good of a person but like <laughs> it takes time i'll say like you have to have a buffer zone i feel like you know by the time we're on sure. to, you have to have like a solid like two years for that callus to build up and mm. then you can be like you can't hurt me the critics already did that oh, i've cried <laughs> i've <laughs> cried my tears for this one bring it on bro um <laughs> but yeah i feel like by that time you know you can have fun with it that makes so. sense, yeah yeah okay well thank you all so much so give us some plugs where can we come see you Dead Meat is on YouTube. It's, it's where it lives, but the Dead Meat podcast is also where podcasts are found. Yeah. Spotify, you can listen to, or you can watch the video version of the podcast on the Dead Meat channel also. Mm -hmm. You can also listen to James along with actress Catherine Corcoran over at the Scream Dreams podcast made by AMP. And you can find that one um, wherever you get your podcast. Also on YouTube at Scream Dreams Pod. And I got to help set that one up. I'm an associate producer on it. The show's awesome. Deadbeat James is the social media handle on uh, Instagram and Twitter and TikTok. Um, we, we pay like a 21 year old to do that. A lot of the TikTok and stuff because we can't. We can't I was going to say, I, every, so I make lists that every day of things that I have to do during my day. And every day I write down, make TikTok video. 
and it never gets done. It never gets it's crossed like, off. Yeah, it's the one that you never. leave. Yeah. Never. Like, Every oh, single time I look at it, I'm like, that's 45 minutes of my life peering yeah. over my phone looking at editing software. Like it never gets yeah, done. Yeah, like <laughs> timeline editing on a phone, kill me. It sucks. Now. It, it sucks. So, it sucks. But then I look at my daughter and she can literally, like, I've paid her. I've been like, honey, can I give you like $20 to make mommy's <laughs> TikTok video? And she'll do it. Um, And she's like 10 seconds and she's done. And I'm yeah. like, I can't see. I'm so just out of the loop on that one. But I want to be there. I want to be doing it. So I need right. a 21 year old sound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyways thank you all so much for joining us tonight um for those of you who are really looking for some weird 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 stuff you can check out our patreon show deep cuts and we will be back in two weeks with what are we doing i don't even know elric won't let me plan ahead it's Do you post, know what we're doing? It's post valentine's so it's anti-love something i don't know yet we haven't really talked about it yeah we didn't figure yeah. that out it's going to be anti-love something yeah. I, we should go see like the lisa frankenstein this week and that's the big yes. takeaway um and you're going to see a24 something right yeah i think yeah but it's probably a secret so i probably can't say um, oh boo okay well we'll hear about that one maybe next episode <laughs> thank you all so much for tuning in the colors of the dark podcast is a fangoria production producers and co-hosts are rebecca mckendry and elric kane executive producers are tara ainsley and abby ghoul sonic branding by michael rodriguez and of course our amazing sound engineer ernie hurtado 